Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Maria Liu, and we're going to be speaking about challenges with topographies and the benefits of topographies in orthokeratology on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Maria Liu, and Maria has just been doing some incredible research in the world of myopia. Um, Maria runs the Myopia Clinic at, uh, at Berkeley and has just done some incredible research that we're excited to share with you. In our pre-discussion, Maria and I already uh, I think we're probably coming up with more questions than we're answering in this podcast because there's so much great stuff to talk about. Maria, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. David, thanks for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Maria's uh, background is uh, is very rich with her degree in ophthalmology, then her degree in optometry here in the States, and then her uh, her master's and her PhD. And, uh, you know, the learning never stops, does it, Maria? Absolutely. Uh, actually, I learn from our students every day. So Yes, such a cool thing. So Maria, you, you've had some opportunity to really evaluate a lot of aspects. You have this incredible international uh, understanding of myopia, maybe better than a lot of people. You've been involved with the, uh, the IMI papers and bringing around some understanding around international myopia uh, things. Um, you and I have been talking a little bit about topography, and you've recently been doing some research with regards to orthokeratology and topography and corneal shape and so forth. I was hoping you could share with us a little bit about the research that you're doing and how we might be able to incorporate that into our practice. So first of all, um, I think topography is an essential tool to guide um, both the initial feeding of ortho -K lenses as well as troubleshooting. And we can use topography to really understand whether the lenses are centered in this overnight sleep, obviously. A bigger, uh, the biggest difference between uh, a feeding ortho K lenses versus other specialty lenses is that uh, we're feeding the lenses with patients sitting up behind the slit lamp in our chair. But in reality, the lenses are worn with patients maintaining a supine position with the lid closed and with the rapid eye movement during their sleep. Mm. So topography is so important in guiding us to really understand exactly how the lenses behaved with the overnight sleep. Yeah. Uh, the more we use topography, the more we really understand that sometimes the topography is not giving us the information that's uh, straightforward and easy to understand. And we have all learned that we need to use different um, display to really understand uh, lens behavior. But in terms of understanding exactly how large the size of the treatment zone that's achieved on the corneal surface. And if for any one of you who have, you know, tried axial map versus tangential map, you will see the size of the treatment zone is actually quite different depending on which display you use. Mm -hmm. So when uh, now we understand that the size of the treatment zone is becoming a very important component in understanding um, patients' response to ortho K in terms of anti-myopia efficacy, how do we design myopia control optimized ortho K lenses? When you really need to understand what is the true treatment size. And so I'm hoping with the help of the industry, we can have a standardized way of understanding like this is how we quantify the size of the treatment zone. So Maria, instead you, you, of like some people reporting it in tangential maps, some reporting yeah. in axial maps, some reporting in post-treatment, some reporting in difference maps, et cetera. Right, right. So, you know, the, the, the main maps that I look at when I'm doing my topography on my orthokeratology patients is I look at the axial map and I look at the tangential map. And for a pre-fitting, I look at the elevation map. Um, any other maps that 
you know, people are, are finding to be valuable that you're aware of, or are those the main ones? I think those are the main ones of from um, a placebo based topographers. Mm -hmm. But uh, a very important thing I want to point out here is that um, they're actually not highly comparable either between different platforms, for example, your elevation analysis and your corneal um, eccentricity is very different between a placebo based topographer versus a shine fleck image based topographer, like mm -hmm. for example, Panacam. Right. And even within the same platform, all placebo based, you will see a pretty significant difference depending on each model or each brand of the topographer. Mm -hmm. So most of the topographers are validated more on the central three, five, seven millimeter of the cornea because the main purpose for the topographer used to be for refractive surgery or for the track of a corneal pathology. But in terms of ortho K fitting, we know the majority of the lens weight is bared on the periphery, mid periphery cornea or even far periphery. And uh, whether the each algorithm from different brand is generating a reliable um, topographer image that's comparable across the platform, that we actually don't know. I try to search for any kind of validation studies outside of the central seven millimeter cord, and there is none. <laughs> and that's where all the information that we want to know is. So you alluded to this, uh, this beneficial of the orthokeratology effect for slowing myopia. And that is this uh, treatment zone. I think many people know what you mean by that, but can you mm -hmm. kind of describe what what that is? And uh, then let's dig in a little bit into this different maps issue. So by definition, one of the, um, actually, this is a very interesting question because I don't think we have a it sounded like definition. an easy question. It sounded like an easy question, yeah. but I laid you up for that, right? What is Yeah. This? <laughs> so um, we assume the size of the treatment zone is the area where we see the central corneal flattening. Yeah. But uh, how you define the border of the uh, flattening, like from which point the cornea started flattening is very different depending on whether you're looking at a tangential map versus an axial map. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's only one component in understanding an optimized, uh, like a myopia control design. Yeah. And another important component is actually the profile in the paracentral steepening area. Mm. So in this, what we call the anti-myopia dosage or the hot ring that's induced by the reverse curve or the return zone of the ortho K lenses. Yeah not only the location of that paracentral steepening ring is important, the width of it is also important because the wider the paracentral steepening area, the more area the plus the focus is imposed to the retina. And also the wider that area is, the larger the impact on positive spherical aberration and on coma as well. Mm -hmm. Both of them are have been established as a pretty reliable anti-myopia um, factor. Right. So we had a myopia podcast with Randy Kojima, where he talks mm -hmm. about spherical aberration, coma being important things. And this is one way short of having an aberrometer that you can measure it or see the correlation is large red ring, likely high amounts of spherical mm -hmm. aberration, coma, likely better effects of myopia management. Exactly. So you can see the size of the central corneal flattening and the profile of the paracentral steepening, they're coupled together. Mm -hmm. You can have like, you know, the change on one without um, impacting on the other. Yeah. So when we're talking about a specific design or a specific type of corneal shape that may actually have better anti-myopia efficacy, do we know whether it's solely due to the influence on the size of the treatment area, or it's actually more related to its impact on the paracentral steepening area? Yeah. So potentially, until we know this data for sure, should it be that we uh, um, shoot for and target 
a big red ring and uh, you know a smaller treatment zone? Is that kind of what we should be thinking about for now in your perspective? That I truly don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to nail you down on an answer, <laughs> right? So let me ask you a different question is, um, if, if you were in clinical practice, which you are with the myopia uh, clinic, what uh, zone, uh, what, what, what map are, are you looking at to kind of have an indication for you? Are you looking at the difference display tangential, axial? Are you looking at the post-treatment map? You know, we don't, we don't know which one it is, but where, where is your thinking or where, where do you, you look when you're in, in seeing patients? To be honest, um, if I start my patients early, meaning if I'm able to fit them with ortho K lenses at the beginning stage of this uh, disease development, and they in general tend to um, have better outcomes. So in that case, I really don't care whether I'm using tangential or axial, as long as their axial length is growing slower and I see minimal change on refraction, and I'm happy. And for those who are not responding well to ortho K lenses, it also doesn't matter because I, I don't really know what is an optimized design. So at this point, mostly I'm trying to add a, an atropine to the treatment, yeah. uh, like a regimen. So to answer your question, I think for research purpose, we can probably dive in more. And I personally, I'm leaning toward using the axial map in understanding the size of the treatment area, but I'm more using the tangential map to understand better the paracentral steepening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good clinical pearl mm -hmm. for us. And I, I will allow you to put the caveat that we still need more research on this. But uh, I also am looking towards that axial map, but I look at the tangential and it's almost as if I want to look to the axial for the, for, the, uh, for the refractive effect and then the tangential for the fit effect of how big of that ring is it. So that would be, I think, our takeaway, our pearl um, with regards to this, but more information to come uh, in, in, in what we're going to be looking at. Let's dive a little bit into pharmaceuticals right now, you know, mm -hmm. in the United States and in several other countries, atropine is really the, the place that's really where it's at with regards to slowing the progression from a pharmaceutical perspective. I want to dive into atropine and its side effects in, in a moment here, but are you aware just in the research that's being done on other pharmaceuticals that are being looked at for myopia? Uh, more in the animal studies, yeah, uh, not sure. so much in the clinical trials. And so far, as far as I know, atropine is the only topical agent being investigated. There mm -hmm. is another one uh, as an oral medication that's been more um, heavily investigated in Europe. But uh, I don't that think that's going to happen. the precursor of, of caffeine? Is that the one? Yes, uh, yes yeah, the yeah. seven um, zesium, uh, mesobenzene. Yes. And um, so one of the metabolites of the 7-MMP is caffeine, uh, mm -hmm. making people feel like this is in general a pretty safe drug. Yeah. However, due to its you know, systemic administration, so it's likely impacting on multiple systems and multiple organs, and it's used in kids, and it's used for multiple years. And um, based on my understanding, the chance of it you know, being as a clinical trial in us it's going to be very low in the yeah. next several years yeah there's there's others that are out there but whether they get beyond animal studies is still yet to be seen so we're riding this atropine train probably for at least another three to five to seven years particularly because we've got a lot more going on with regards to research studies to be able to pass a pharmaceutical yeah. product through in the united states so we're riding this atropine train for a while so the question becomes, how much and is it safe? Uh, so tell us a little bit about your perspectives on that. I think um, for low-dose atropine, um, I actually use atropine in all sorts of concentrations. Back in China, atropine 1% has been used for myopia control, half percent 
like a point one to five percent. So you know, you do the maths. Chinese people are pretty like a、uh, creative in like creating different kinds of concentrations. But I do have to say, in the range from anywhere from point zero one percent to point one percent, it's generally considered to be pretty safe. Yeah, yeah.、Um, and and then a、uh, uh, efficacy, it, you know. Why? Why is it being used in all of those different concentrations? Is it this perspective that if you have a higher myope, a higher concentration, or a lower myope, you use a higher concentration? Or when do you switch from one concentration to another? That's a great question. At least in animal studies and in several clinical trials, it has been shown that atropine has a pretty significant dose dependent. Response both in terms of its anti-myopia efficacy as well as the severity of side effects. So the higher the concentration we use, in general, it creates better anti-myopia efficacy. However, the higher the concentration we use, and the more severe the side effects, and the more the higher potential for rebound effect if、mm-hmm. being discontinued very abruptly. Mm-hmm. So How, this is a tricky balance to maintain. Yeah. In terms of what's the initial concentration, and when do we actually increase the concentration?、Mm-hmm. I don't think we have a like a clinical guideline、um, at this point. So each doctor is probably still doing it based on their personal experience combined with literature results. Yeah. Well, a lot of the literature that's been out there,、uh, and what's been done internationally, is talking about point zero one percent. Would you recommend that that's where clinicians start? So,、um, both from lamp study as well as my clinical experience,、uh, we do feel like point zero one percent is a little bit too low、yeah. to create a clinically significant myopia inhibiting effect. So currently, my use of a point zero one percent is mostly、uh, related in two、um, areas. Number one, for someone who's already under multifocal or ortho K treatment, but we're not seeing satisfactory myopia controlling efficacy, I add point zero one percent atropine as a combination treatment.、Mm. I also use a very low concentration as a preventative.、Um, Uh, approach. So, for highly motivated parents, they bring their kids in six years old, a cyclopeach refraction as Plano, and、uh, those are the ones that not even myopic yet, but they're already on the track of becoming myopia.、Mm-hmm. And those are usually the patients I start with, point zero one percent. Yeah, yeah.、Um... That that I, I think that there's some rationale and some understanding、mm-hmm. of why you do that, particularly around the preventative. And some people are just aren't comfortable considering that 0.05 percent is so much stronger than 0.01 percent. Well, when you think about it, compared to the one percent atropine, it's considerably less,、uh, even at 0.05.、Um, so you know, I I would say that if if Somebody listening doesn't use atropine currently.、Um, we know the dose dependency, and you know, using higher concentration certainly isn't something you need to be concerned about. Monitor your patients for side effects. See how it goes.、Um, we generally start almost everybody on 0.05 percent in our practice. I think the lamp study really helped us see. The point oh one versus point oh five versus point oh two, and the benefit of that. I I, I really、uh, want to be、uh, cognizant of our time here, but I wanted to talk one last topic, and that is how、uh, a, a phased approach that many people are going about is. Well, now there's multifocal soft contact lenses available. I'm just going to do that for everybody, and if we do. Should we expect the same results from everybody with those lenses? And I think your work and some things you've researched shows us that maybe we shouldn't see the same. We won't see the same effects for everybody. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So one consistency we see across all of the anti-myopia clinical trials is a significant individual variability responding、yeah. to the、um, treatments. And that individual variability is present even within the same trial, but also across different trials. So there are two components to this individual variability 
uh, responding to antimyopia treatment. Number one is the same treatment, actually providing the same antimyopia dosage to each patient. Mm -hmm. For example, when we're talking about ortho K, the same design created totally different corneal topographical changes. So even though we are using the same design, but they're not creating the same antimyopia dosage. For ortho K patients, it's what the corneal shape that matters during their daytime vision, mm -hmm. not what is you know, the design on the, back, on the back surface of the lens. So that's one layer of contributing to this individual variability. That is the same treatment is not creating the same antimyopia dosage. On top of that, we also know that myopia is a very complex disease with a genetic predisposition and the environmental influence and a very complicated interactions between those two factors. So even if we have the same anti-myopia dosage delivered to each patient, they will still respond differently depending on how strong the genetic predisposition is, the age of the onset of myopia, and uh, their like a scleral structure in the posterior pole. Obviously, the thicker the scleral structure, the more robust um, the scleral fibers is and the more resistant to intraocular pressure. So all of these factors have not been fully studied. And so at this point, for all of those, you know, patients responding to treatment differently, we actually don't know whether it's the first, they are getting different antimyopia dosage from the treatment, or naturally they just have slightly different pathoetiology of myopia, hence, you know, having different efficacy. Yeah, I think that's really about treating the patient and not the condition, right? We we wouldn't ever consider a minus 250, uh, 50 year old adult to be the exact same as another 250 uh, adult, right? How much ad are you going to give them? Are you going to give them a pair of glasses for computer? Are you going to, you know, modify their contact lenses for the activities that they're doing? And we can't just say a child is a minus two is a minus two and every treatment is going to work the exact same for them. Corneal shape, environmental factors, those sort of things really play into that. And I think what it tells us is that treating the patient and monitoring the patient is the important part, not just the refractive error. And so axial length comes into that equation and considerations of utilizing combo treatment or switching to a different treatment. You know, we, we had a great conversation with your mentor and mine, Patrick Caroline, is that in these studies, you know, they've got the protocol that they have to follow for every child. And so at the end of the study, we get the, you know, improvement as the average, right? But in clinical mm -hmm. practice, we would never treat patients that way. The ones that are not coming along as effectively, we're going to switch something after a year rather than waiting the three years, right? So the effectiveness Absolutely. of this in practice is, uh, is, you know, research isn't practice. It drives us to do things better in practice, but the effect of myopia management is way higher than the research shows us because in clinical practice, the, the kiddo who's not pro is progressing still we're going to modify their treatment and then the myopia management is going to be far better. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking yeah. of the minus two, if you have a six years old minus two versus a 10 years old minus two, you're treating totally two different uh, situations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been incredible. Great information. I think we could probably talk about all of this stuff for another hour and a half, two hours. And, uh, you know, or maybe we, we, the <laughs> next 20 hours. <laughs> that's right. That's oh, right uh, can sure. I add one more thing? Yes, please. So, in terms of testing, uh, baseline testing and follow up yeah. testing, um, I do want to add one uh, very, very critical component that's mm -hmm. been constantly um, ignored. Um, that is pupil size and angle kappa or angle mm. lambda, however you want to measure it. We now know that pupil size may have very important interactions in terms of like a patient's response to ortho K lenses or multifocal lenses. And um, at the current stage, a lot of uh, ocular biometers yeah. actually offer pupil um, testing, but mm -hmm. I rarely see practitioners um, talking about how they measure pupil size. I can tell you the pupil size measured from the topographers are not as um, reliable. So if we're really 
Uh, number one, I would strongly advocate we take a pupil size measurement as part of the standard um, baseline testing and also angle kappa. Um, this is also important in terms of understanding even for a perfectly centered ortho K lens relative to the anatomical cornea, um, it may actually create totally different, you know, aberration depending on the angle kappa. Mm -hmm. So this is something if a higher order aberration is one of the important anti-myopia component of ortho K, it understanding the patient's angle kappa is also important in helping us understand why some patients responded better versus the others in ortho K and multifocal lenses, yeah. which are all available information from the ocular biometers, but I rarely hear people talking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's also important as we look for biometers to become more readily available. And uh, what's the important information? You know, we've got instruments internationally, the Lens Star, and we've got uh, the, the Myopia Master, um, you know, great instruments, and maybe we need to add uh, this measurement and this, you know, this understanding of pupil size and angle kappa. How do you recommend people measure angle kappa? So angle kappa, you, if you, I think it's also available in several um, corneal topographers. Yeah. But if you're looking at the pupil berry center, mm -hmm. it will give you a delta X and delta Y. That's basically telling you the vertical and horizontal difference or the distance of the pupil center relative to the optical axis of the instrument. Yeah, yeah. and and usually on topographers, there's little marks that indicate yeah. either the visual axis pupil center, so great. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. This has been an incredible uh, conversation. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so you can stay tuned to future episodes. And we'll see you next time on the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.